Hey guys, welcome back on a very cold day. You're on the grounds of the National Cathedral and uh, we start most of our hikes there because it's across the street from my house and because, well, as you can see, it's rather pretty. Yes, there is a Darth Vader gargoyle up on to the left, the left tower about three-fourths of the way up, there is a small Darth Vader gargoyle. You can actually buy that from the gift shop. So we are out for our hike. It is really cold. It is below zero, well, below zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit. And uh, we've got a scarf on, so hopefully, hopefully we'll get a chance to take the scarf down a bit. And we're going to start a tour of famous spy locations in Washington, D.C. This is being simulcast. This is live on Twitter Periscope, and this will be uploaded later to YouTube, my YouTube channel, Penguin6, my Twitter, Penguin6. There we go. Whew. Breathe a little bit. So the first stop is actually going to be right over here. How you guys been today? Do I ever live stream on YouTube? Sometimes, but not often. And it's mainly a technical thing. I, I just prefer to put out on YouTube the best quality video, like 4K, 60 frames a second, really gorgeous color. Um, but if there's something really urgent, I will put it on YouTube, yeah? You know, if there's like some, like, news-breaking, newsworthy thing, I would stream to YouTube. But generally, I stream to Periscope Twitter because it's in the final days. In fact, my, uh, my Twitter beta app expired today. It will never be renewed, which was a shame because I really like that app. So our first location, folks, is right across the street. That is known as Alban Towers. Alban Towers was a hotel back in the 1930s, 1940s. And it entertained some very famous guests, like Frank Sinatra actually stayed here, and many other celebrities. However, in the early 1930s, there was one guest, naval attache Taman Yamaguchi. Taman Yamaguchi was the naval attache from the Japanese government at the embassy from uh, 1935, 1936 era. He was suave. He was like a Japanese James Bond. Spoke English fluently, very well-mannered, well-versed, and everybody, including the FBI, thought he was a spy. One day, the FBI decided to go into his apartment, and they could find absolutely nothing that implicated him as a spy. Nothing. But they were still very suspicious. In 1936, the Japanese government, kind of feeling that he was probably exposed, decided to recall him back to Tokyo. A few years later, while in Tokyo working with the Japanese Navy, he came up with an idea with several other guys on attacking the U.S. fleet in Pearl Harbor. He was one of the architects of the Pearl Harbor attack. Now, he didn't live long to enjoy it because about six months later, at the Battle of Midway, he was the commander of the Hiryu, one of the four Japanese aircraft carriers that was sunk. If you've seen the Battle of Midway movie, the last aircraft carrier sank on the Japanese side. The captain went down with his ship. That captain was Mr. Yamaguchi, who's lived right over there. So, a little bit of World War II history, spiced in with a little bit of spy history. So we're going to walk down this road towards the Russian embassy, former Soviet embassy, and see what stuff. Now, we've seen some of this stuff in recent hikes around the area. So if you're a regular watcher, you might see a few things that repeat. But I'm going to show you some new stuff today, some stuff that I've never shown you before. Right now, you're in an area called Cathedral Heights because we're up around the cathedral. We're going to walk into a neighborhood known as Glover Park. And Glover Park is where the Russian embassy is. And then its next neighborhood is Georgetown. 
And Georgetown, of course, is a very historic neighborhood in Washington with many famous politicians and celebrities and all sorts of other people living there. Do, 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 do. I think there's an arrow. Well, let's go for it. Yeah, we made it. <laughs> Embassy Row, Embassy Row starts right over there on Massachusetts Avenue. And I might come back up Embassy Row, oh, <laughs> in about a, in a couple hours, maybe. This hike's gonna take quite a while. Ah, it's cold. Is it worth it to live in Georgetown? No, it's overpriced. I mean, it's nice and it's got some amenities, but it's really fallen on hard times. It's not the trendy part of town anymore. I mean, it's the old money part of town and it's pretty and all that, but parking sucks, there's rats everywhere and you pay way too much for what you rent compared to other parts of the city. So, I guess it depends what you want. Yeah, rats everywhere. I mean, Georgetown is infested with rats. You can't go into Georgetown at night and not see rats. And it's just, ugh, it's disgusting. Part of the city is my favorite. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I like Georgetown, don't get me wrong. But uh, there's some other areas that are pretty cool too. So, oh, hey, we're here. No, let's stop here for a second. Oh, we're on Fulton Street too. So this nondescript apartment building was the home of a woman named Jennifer Miles. Jennifer Miles, back in the 1970s, was a diplomat with the South African Embassy, but just sort of a, a entry-level kind of diplomat. She was about 25, 26 years old, and she was described as one of the most beautiful women ever to arrive in Washington, D.C. Now, unbeknownst to many people, she was also quite enamored with the Cuban Revolution, and she fancied herself somewhat as an operative for Fidel Castro and all the others down in Cuba. Now, what did she do? Well, she decided that she would try to get some information from individuals using whatever means necessary. The FBI got wind of this when a rather old portly bureaucrat reported that the most beautiful woman in Washington was after him for information uh, 15 minutes after he was seduced. <laughs> now, he knew what was going on. The FBI started to tail her. They started to count on all the people that visited her. And after it got to about 100, they said, okay, let's stop counting and let's, uh, let's roll this up. She turned out to be just sort of some sort of amateur kind of spy, not really a professional agent. She went back to South Africa and lived in obscurity. But uh, when it broke that there was a beautiful young diplomat spying for the communists, of course, there was lots of publicity in the newspapers. The Supreme Court is up on Capitol Hill, and uh, we walked around there a couple times. Sorry, sorry. So, DC law requires you wear a mask anytime you're within six feet of another person. So, when I'm all by myself, I don't have to wear a mask, but when I encounter another person, I have to be wearing a mask. But we'll take a break now. <sighs> Though today is actually pretty cold. Now, down here is another story. I actually showed you guys this the other day, but uh, we're gonna stop here again, just because it's kind of interesting. And nobody really knows if it's true anyway. The Russian embassy is behind these buildings. The Russian embassy is actually a giant diplomatic compound with an embassy, a consulate, and even living facilities for the Russian employees. It is widely spoken that a tunnel was built from an FBI safe house under the Russian embassy. Now the FBI had two known, not safe houses, but operational houses next to the Russian embassy. One of them I'm going to show you in a minute, and it is still operational as an FBI house. 
The other one was right here, 3814 Fulton Street. The house has been torn down and replaced with this very nice, modern-looking three-story building. But it is believed this may have been the entrance to the Russian Tunnel. Because that building right there, that white building you see in the distance, that's the Russian Embassy. So. <laughs> nah. So, the tunnel's existence was disclosed in a trial of a spy who leaked the information to the Russians. The tunnel's code name was Operation Monopoly. It's said to be big enough that an adult human could walk through the tunnel under the Russian embassy. Now, the FBI director has said that there was no uh, valuable intelligence ever gained from that tunnel's existence. But they didn't fill it in. They just sealed off the entrance. So as far as we know, the tunnel is still there. When the old U.S. Embassy in Moscow was renovated, they found several tunnels under it as well. <laughs> it's just all part of the game. Oh, it's pretty chilly out. Yeah, there's also a trade mission that's front as a good front for spying. The Russian trade mission or something like that. Huh. So our forecast is for snow and ice tomorrow. Then it's going to rain on Sunday. And then it's going to snow again next week. It's really the, the grumpy part of winter. And the thing that's really awful, the snow never sticks. We don't get any, like, beautiful snow-covered streets. It just snows and turns instantly to slush. <laughs> it's kind of like, ugh. So we get the driving headache, but we don't actually get the fun. So we're coming back to Wisconsin Avenue again. We'll cross the street this time. We looked at that house the other day. It's like 1.7 million. You still have growl. Annapolis is about a half hour, 45 minutes from DC, but it's a little bit cooler than DC, I think. Southern Maryland is supposed to get some snow. I think I read, ooh. Uh, I don't think there's many skunks in DC, but it sure does smell like it. We're gonna hit a lot of British spies. I got some British spy stories that we're gonna catch up on in a bit. But that waits, that's wait till we get to Georgetown. You know what, let's just go to the next light. The next light's controlled. And we can get closer to the Russian embassy anyway. At one time, most of the Cambridge spy ring was deployed in the Foreign Service in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think all but one of them actually served over here. So a Russian embassy is just up a block or so. Off of my left, you can start to make out a red brick house in the distance there. And that red brick house is known widely as an FBI operations house. I don't think I'm going to go inside the Russian embassy. Though, to be honest, the Russians are probably listening to this broadcast. <laughs> now, it's well known that the FBI operates out of that house across the street. It is still an active FBI property. Now, it's also strongly suggested that in this apartment building, there are one or two apartments overlooking the Russian embassy that are also owned and operated by the FBI. Now, I haven't got confirmation on that. Well, I've heard about that a couple different sources. 
it's not like you can look up the leases in the government uh, property database for FBI houses. <laughs> All right, we're gonna wait a second so we don't get killed. Good on the left, more or less good on the right. Let's cross the street. Breaking the law, breaking the law. For those of you in another country, this is a U.S. mailbox, all right? This will become relevant in about 10 minutes. Not that specific mailbox, but a mailbox in general. So over there, guys, that's the Russian embassy. That's a former Veterans Administration hospital that was declared surplus, and it was actually going to pot. It's kind of falling apart. And then the Russians stepped in and bought it and turned it into the Russian embassy. This is a homeless guy. As soon as the Russians did that, the FBI came over and obtained this property. Now, the shades are always down. There's like camera footage, private property signs, stay away, stay away. And people have seen cameras up in the windows sometimes. So that building just screams, you are not welcome. And this is generally regarded as the FBI safe house. Now, some people think that the tunnel extends from here under the street into the Russian embassy. But that would have to go under a major road and then cross all that land just to get to the Russian embassy. That's why other people think the Fulton Street address is a more probable location for the tunnel. But like most things in Spycraft, you're never actually going to find out exactly where the tunnel is going to be. So this camera here is actually just a traffic camera, but on top of it is a spy camera. And there's several of these cameras all over the place. I'm on like, I can't count how many times they film me. Because <laughs> I walk here all the time. All right. So we're going to go down here. Now, if you've got a good ear, that actually sounded like Russian. What happens, Russia is one of the few countries that sends all their families over as diplomats. So like the husband will be a diplomat and the wife will be a secretary. Or the wife is a diplomat and the husband is a driver. Everybody works. So everybody lives together, works together. And there's lots of young Russian families. Pretty much, I don't know, the majority of families I see walking on this sidewalk with little kids are speaking Russian. <laughs> If you like, you want to meet a nice Russian mom or something, this is where you come. <laughs> They're always out walking the kids. Yeah, Periscope was very popular in Russia for a while. Hello. So this is the start of the Glover Park neighborhood. Actually a good barbecue place here. It's kind of tempting me for lunch. Babushkas. No, nah, not yet. It was funny, my buddy worked in Moscow and he had to hire a secretary and he got like he got like a hundred resumes because he worked for a western company and of course they wanted to work for a western company. And he said that like half of the women that applied for the job were just unbelievably gorgeous and fully qualified. You know, educated, college educated, spoke English fluently, gorgeous, beautiful. And he was just like, no, I'm hiring a babushka. <laughs> so he hired this older woman, grandma, who actually, he thinks actually had some like intelligence service connections because she would actually do a really good job steering away like potential mafia guys from doing business with him, which was kind of saved him some. So this is the park where a lot of the Russian diplomats come to play. Too many kids to film. So we'll have to blur that. I've watched some of the Americans. Uh, I just haven't had time to like binge the whole series. <sighs> I don't know what they're building over here. Looks like a new pipe. This is where I go for barbecue. Rockland's barbecue is really good. Uh, 
what's the little pierogies or whatever, the little dumpling thing, Russian? You know, I had the, one of the best things I had in Moscow was, I guess it's like Ukrainian chicken. They salt this chicken. They put it on a hot stone, and then they put another hot stone on top of it. So it sort of flattens out the chicken. And the two stones cook the chicken, and it's kind of salted. So I've had borscht, yeah. I don't mind borscht. But this, this salted chicken I had in Moscow was actually really quite good. And they told me, oh, no, this is Ukrainian. This isn't Russian. I'm like, okay, whatever. Okay, we got another spy location coming up here. So this is the Whole Foods market. There's also a Safeway down the street. Both Whole Foods and Safeway have been used for dead drops and active drops between agents and uh, spies who have been handing off documents. They've arrested spies and found out that documents were passed or shopping carts were passed with documents inside them. I showed you this the other day. This is a place called Good Guys. And, well, let's just say good guys don't go to this place. <laughs> Bachelors on the night of their wedding go to this place, yeah? You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the other people that love to go there are Russians. The Russian diplomats love to go down to good guys. And outside here, you used to find FBI cars all the time during the Cold War. They were bummed out because indoors, the Russians were eating chicken wings and drinking shots and watching the show. And outdoor, the FBI guys were eating, like, stale coffee and stuff like that. <laughs> wasn't quite ideal from their perspective. Hmm. Hey, how's it going, Lisa? I should get a skateboard. I can do this a lot faster on a skateboard. This building on my left is just sort of a boring office building. However, the next building on the left houses the Chinese embassy's consulate. That's where they get a visa, that's where you get your Chinese passport renewed, stuff like that. So of course, it's high on the list of places that are watched. I believe also, I think the Swiss embassy is in one of these buildings as well. Or they have, the Swiss embassy has some offices in one of these buildings. I actually got to go across the street. Hmm. This is a little tricky because this next little bit of the hike, I've never actually walked this trail that supposedly exists on Google Maps. So we may end up having a one or two block dead hike. So we're at Wisconsin and W Street, Northwest right now. And we're gonna cut back through here because on Google Maps, on Google Maps it says that there's a path that connects over to 37th Street, which is where I wanna be. If, if for some reason there isn't a path, then I gotta walk backwards, which is annoying. These are little Glover Park houses. These houses, basically a million dollars. These little townhouses, plus or minus 200,000. Big one could be 1.2, 1.3, a small one could be 800. That's funky. There is a path. Yay! There is a small path over here. All right, let's go down. This is Glover Park. This is the neighborhood just north of Georgetown. 
Now, unscrupulous real estate agents will call this <clears throat> North Georgetown in the hopes of uh, obtaining a slightly higher price because of the Georgetown name. But most DC people call this Glover Park. And then there's another neighborhood called Burleaf, which is just a little bit north of the campus. We're gonna be going through there in just a moment. So here's the little path. I didn't know this path existed. This is the Washington DC federal look. I think that's, the, that's how they describe a lot of the townhouses, some sort of federal style townhouses. It's very unique. It's uh, used a lot in movies and stuff. If you watch like the West Wing or any movies filmed in DC, they always try to feature Georgetown or Capitol Hill because they have these apartments and townhouses that just look very Washingtonian, Washington. All right, 37th and W, we've got to go down a couple blocks to the left to see our next little location. Do -do -do -do. Is that a set of the Americans? It might. I wonder if they filmed that here. So let me try something with this camera. Sometimes the neighbors get together and they decide to all paint their houses a different color. Or sometimes they decide to paint their houses the same color. And it's kind of funny. U Street. Okay, we got a couple more to go. Uh, I am warming up a little bit. I knew I'd warm up after hiking a bit. Yeah. But you can see like the patterns in these houses. Like look at the roof line. They're all pretty much the same style. The same little accoutrements. These are actually like, this one has like two doors. It's like a duplex or something. Hmm. Do I miss Hong Kong? Yes, I miss Hong Kong quite a bit. But like anything, it's, you know, what we call the curse of the expat. When you've been an expat living overseas, you start to discover there are things you like in one country and things you like in another country, such that no one country is actually perfect, you know? I like the French fries I used to get in Moscow. They were delicious. I like going to soccer games in London. I like the noodles in Hong Kong. I like breathing clean air in the U.S. And believe me, once you've lived in Asia, coming back to the U.S. is like a gift to your lungs. I like Amazon Prime, <laughs> you know. There's all these different things that each country has and each country offers, such that no one country is perfect. That's why when I retire, I want to have like five or six houses around the world. <laughs> the French fries at Hooked in Hong Kong are good. If you do go to Hong Kong, check out Hooked Fish and Chips. It's a New Zealand style fish and chip place. Australian New Zealand fish and chips are much better than British fish and chips. There, I said it. All you Brits can like kill me. But uh, no, Aussie, Oz and uh, New Zealand fish and chips are very light batter and really good. Yeah. If I had to pick just one place to live, oh God, I don't think I could do that, to be honest. Um, different things, I mean, if I was retiring, I would probably pick someplace quiet. If I was living with the kids, it would be probably like someplace like Hong Kong, which is very, very easy to live with kids because servants are so cheap and everybody's sort of in the same environment, but it's just so expensive. I don't know. I've never really, I haven't thought of that yet. My wife and I avoid those discussions. <laughs> we don't want to talk about retiring. New Zealand is pretty and all, but it's, you know, isolated and expensive. I remember uh, I had a friend from New Zealand and he was working for an American company. And he's like, our monthly revenues at this American company exceed the yearly revenues of the New Zealand company. And the New Zealand company was like one of the three biggest countries, companies in their country. So it was like, just not worth it. Hmm. S, two more blocks. Northern Idaho. 
I drove through southern Idaho. It was quite pretty. We were driving from we were driving to Yellowstone, yeah. So we were going through southern Idaho, and I was using the the app called um, Road Tripper, which is a great app for doing a road trip. And then it said, if you go 15 miles east of your location, you can see the house where Napoleon Dynamite was filmed. And I turned to the wife and I'm like, Napoleon Dynamite, let's go. And she's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, what's the chance we'll ever be here? She's like, who cares? We're not going to see Napoleon Dynamite's house. I'm like, oh. Get on this side of the street. Yeah, so you can get this app called Road Tripper. And Road Tripper is a road trip planning app. So when we drove across country a couple of years ago, we used Road Tripper to uh, figure out where we, we know what to see, what to do. Have I lived in the Netherlands? No, I've been to the Netherlands quite a few times. Uh, I like it there. Um, actually, I, I do like Amsterdam quite a bit. Favorite area of DC? Hmm. I don't really know. I mean, I lived in Georgetown for a while. I don't know. I don't really get to choose right now. My life now is like all around my kids and stuff like that. It's not like me going out to dinner, me having fun or anything like that. Yeah. We chase Pokemon and, and all around the... We have gone Pokemon hunting pretty much all the way around the world. Hmm. Let's see if we can find this thing. Uh, I think it's right here. I think it was right here. All right, guys. We'll go across the street. So we're behind the Washington International School. Yeah, I'm making puffer jets a lot. Now... In 1993, was it? I think it was 1993. The uh, CIA discovered they had a mole. The mole's name was Aldrich Ames, and he was passing secrets to the Russians. It was 93 or 2000, I can't remember exactly. Now, I think it was 93. The Russian embassy, as you guys remember, is just up the street, and Aldrich Ames was over here. There was a mailbox at this intersection, 37th and R. And Aldrich Ames and his Russian handler worked out a signal. If there was a chalk X mark on the mailbox, that meant documents needed to be passed or a meeting needed to be arranged. So every day, the Russian consulate guy would drive up this street, glance at the mailbox, and know if his spy, his asset, needed to talk. So the mailbox became quite famous for a while. But then, due to cutbacks, the post office removed it. Bummer. A little piece of forgotten spy lore at that intersection. <laughs> All right, so over there is Georgetown University Hospital. Um, I'm using the HAPS app uh, occasionally. Uh, we're still talking to them about uh, some of the updates they've been doing. They were doing a good job bringing out updates. I haven't used it extensively because I've been very, very busy on YouTube lately. Like crazy busy on YouTube. My microphone is uh, under my scarf here. Hang on a second. Uh, we're gonna cross this street. Yeah, they love bricks in Georgetown. Audio's good. The shopping cart got pushed here by some homeless guy. There's actually a grocery store down the street. I'm not even sure where the microphone is for Periscope. Oh, it's over here. Oh, hang on. That's probably why it sucks. How's the Periscope mic now? Is the Periscope volume a little better? 
way better. Okay, <laughs> that's me being a dum-dum. I put the Periscope mic on my hood for my hoodie, but then I actually lifted up my hoodie. And what was on the, uh, <laughs> what was on the outside of my hoodie originally was on the inside of my hoodie when I put my hood up. <laughs> so the microphone wasn't actually, it was basically covered up. <laughs> Duh. Now this gigantic building that you're seeing on my left is the Duke Ellington School for the Performing Arts. This is kind of like the DC's answer to fame. This is a high school for students who want to go into the creative arts, either as an artist or a musician or an actor. And it's a very popular school. It's a public school. Uh, the Periscope video depends on the bandwidth. Sometimes it's 720, sometimes it's 480. It's a real frustration. Okay, we're at 35th Street. I'm gonna go over to 34th. I do have my OJ gloves on. Because it's kind of cold. Yes, that is a giant chair. <laughs> That's a famous artwork by one of their students. It's pretty cool, actually. That used to be just a public high school, and then it became the performing arts school. Actually, some suburban parents like fake their, uh, fake their residency so their kids can go to the school. Uh, who likes the Hong Kong government? Nobody. All right, let's uh, continue on over here. I think we're gonna go down 34th Street. This is at 35th and Reservoir. Behind me, about seven, eight blocks, is the French Embassy, one of the largest embassies in town. Speaking of diplomats, you guys see the license plate. That's a diplomat car. It has the blue State Department issued diplomatic tags. The D means diplomat, and then the next two letters are a country code. The country code can be looked up on the internet so you can track what countries are going where, what vehicles. I don't think it's as highly sought after as Juilliard, but it's a public high school. I mean, it's free to residents of the district. All right, where are we at? 34th? I'm going to go down about two blocks. and talk about Willy Wonka. <laughs> yes, Willy Wonka. Uh, I don't know what time it is, about, about 11.30? I don't even know what time it is. safe yep Ivanka lived over in Calorama which is a couple neighborhoods away from here yeah I think we're in the right street It's just down here, I think. 68, 16, 16, maybe it's the next blocks. Why are there no people on the streets? It's 1215. Um, because DC is basically in a somewhat of a lockdown. Most people are work from home. Kids are study from home. Um, they've asked people not to really go out unless you're exercising like I'm doing right now. 
So we're not going to see a lot of people. Now when we go into the downtown Georgetown area, we'll see a few more. But this is mostly residential. So there's not a lot of people like shopping or anything in this area. There's a tiny little fire station over there. Let's see if I can film it. And it, it has a special place in the hearts of all DC firemen because that's the canteen trucks, the donut truck. The truck that goes to really big fires and helps the firemen recover with free coffee and food. It's run by volunteers, but they keep the truck in a, in a government fire station. That's when you know something's really big. When the, when the food truck responds to a fire, you know you've got a big fire. <laughs> It is a quaint little street. And we're gonna stop down here a bit. Here it is. Um, mostly brick, but there's a few wooden houses. Okay guys, you see this little tiny house here. 1610 34th Street. 1610 34th Street. The man who lived in that house was named Roald Dahl. He wrote books like Matilda, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But before he was a famous kid writer, he actually worked for the British Intelligence Service. Dahl was what was known as part of the Irregulars, a group of British officers who served in the United States designed to combat disinformation and propaganda and bring the United States into the war effort with a European focus. He worked with a wild cast of characters. And one of his jobs was to work on the Congresswoman, Claire Booth Luce. You guys have heard of Dahl before, haven't you? He lived right there. Claire Booth Luce was a prominent isolationist politician, heir to the Luce fortune. And Dahl, um, Dahl, how do I say? Well, he had a very close relationship with her and was able to put forward the British line of thinking in an intimate surrounding. <laughs> this is a nice area. Now down here actually was one of Dahl's friends. Another British guy worked with him down here. Now another guy who worked on the uh, Irregulars was named, was it David Ogilvie, I guess was his name? David Ogilvie? Of Ogilvie and Mather, which is one of the largest, uh, I don't know if you lost sound. I don't think I can, did I mute you? How can I mute you? Do, 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 do. No. Hmm. Hang on. Can you hear me now? Okay. We'll put the speaker back in. Okay. I just put the mic back in and I'm going to test one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a BMW. Did you hear me say this is a BMW? I don't know if we have any banyan trees in DC. Still no sound for you. Well, that's no good. Hang on a second. Exit and come back. Oh, that's no good. All right, let's go down here for a second. This is Volta Place. This is a street. It's Twitter? Okay. Maybe it's just Twitter's fault. I'll blame Twitter. So, down here was a famous spy case. One side of the spy case was known as Whitaker Chambers. The other was a gentleman named Alger Hiss. And Alger Hiss lived in this building this white house with the black shutters, 3415 Volta Place. 
Alger Hiss was a U.S. government employee who originally was working with the Russians, but he got called up. He eventually got somewhat disillusioned, but then he was called up by the House Un-American Activities Committee in a huge, big kerfuffle, and he was determined to be lying before the House Un-American Affairs Committee, and it was a huge, huge debate. And that took place, he used to live right there. That is the Nixon. Now, this next, this is Volta Street, yeah? The next person who lived on Volta Street, we don't know exactly where he lived. We know he lived here because he was close friends with Roald Dahl, and he was actually working with Dahl. But he eventually became very close friends with a guy named Ian Fleming. That man's name was Ivor Bryce. Ivor Bryce was another British spy who was involved in the Irregulars, who uh, lived here on, hey puppy, who lived here on Volta Street. Now, Ivor Bryce had a contribution. Some people say, I think Roald Dahl said that probably 50% of the character of James Bond is actually Ivar Bryce. So Ian Fleming and Ivar Bryce were friends for many, many years. And if you look at some of the dedications in Ian Fleming's books, he actually dedicates portions to Ivar Bryce. And most interesting, Ivar Bryce's middle name is Felix. And for those who are James Bond aficionados, you know who Felix is, Felix Leiter, CIA, James Bond's U.S. companion slash compatriot. And he was named after Ivar Bryce. And he lived on this street. <laughs> okay, let's see where we're going to go next. I actually plotted out this hike. Hmm. Okay, so now we're going to walk. Oh. So I'm going to walk over. We got to walk about. We got to walk about four blocks, five blocks, to get to this next location. Wait a second. This is Volta. That's oh. Hmm. I'm sure there are many spies who still live on these streets. Hmm. So this next location is actually a bit of a hike. So we got to walk four or five blocks to get to it. So we're coming up to Wisconsin Avenue. This is the commercial district of Georgetown. The start of the commercial district. Oh, Georgetown is pretty dead right now. Uh, yeah, some of them want to be secret. To be honest, most spies today are very nondescript, very ordinary, not the flamboyant days of the diplomat spy from England dashing and all that. Far more of a guy who you think's an insurance agent. <laughs> Every other building is FBI in Fairfax. I wouldn't say that, but out in that area, a number of the buildings do have some sort of role, either military or whatever. Huh. I should get a scooter. A scooter would be a lot faster. Um, I've done Twitter Live. It's 
basically the same thing, except the saving of the video is a little bit messed up. Trying to get hit. There's actually some really big houses down here. So we're at 32nd and Q. Q is in Queen, Northwest. And we're making our way up to R Street, 29th and R. So it's a bit of a hike. The Q Street's quite pretty. So we'll walk down here for a while. We're looking for spies. Well, we're looking for the locations that spies used to live in. They don't necessarily do so now. Yeah, there's still Jeep Cherokees. This is a really beautiful house. I don't know the whole history of it. I know it sold for like 25 million, like 10 years ago. It's humongous. And on the other side of the street is the Tudor Mansion, which is actually run by the National Park Service now. And I want to say that, like, they were related to George Washington by marriage. Georgetown is not the most expensive neighborhood. There's another neighborhood called Calorama where the houses are bigger and far, far more expensive. It's mostly diplomats. That's where Ivanka Trump lives, lived. That's where Barack Obama has a house. It's incredibly expensive. In Georgetown, you can still, I mean, there are incredibly expensive houses here. Don't get me wrong. Some of these big monsters you're looking at are $10 million. I'm not kidding. These are easily seven to $10 million, these corner houses. But uh, you can still find places a million and a half, two million dollars as well. Calorama, on the other hand, is crazy expensive. Which one? That one? You like that building? They do a really good Halloween display at that house every year. I used to live down this street many, many moons ago. This is where I, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger came to my house. I told you guys, I told some of you that story. So one, one year, they were filming the movie True Lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Tom Arnold, here in Georgetown, okay? Arnold rented a house for like two months for the filming of the movie. And that just happened to coincide with Halloween. So I was living in Georgetown and the doorbell rang. And I go to the front door, and there's this little tiny girl dressed as Barney. And she just, like, looks at me when I open the door, and she just doesn't say anything. And I said, would you like some candy? And she nodded. And so I put the bowl of candy down in front of her. And then her father, who was with her, was wearing, like, a hoodie and a leather jacket. He says, take only one. And I look up. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger standing in my front doorway. I'm like, oh, this is kind of wild. And then she takes a piece of candy and he says, what do we say? And the little girl goes, trick or treat. <laughs> he just laughs. He's like, no, no, we say danka. And the little girl says, thank you. <laughs> and then they walked away. <laughs> My one brush with Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was filming a spy movie here in Georgetown. We all knew he was here because at the time nobody had a Hummer. He had the first Humvee, the first civilian Humvee ever made, was given to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he used to drive around these narrow streets in Georgetown smoking a cigar in his Humvee. <laughs> it was kind of wild. True Lies was just one of these fun movies you can watch on the weekend. It's not like the meaning of life or anything like that. I think he got paid with an airplane. I think I read that he got paid with a Learjet. 
<laughs> that was his uh, that was his payment. All right, we got to go down another two blocks and then up a block, up a long uphill block. Nice houses, yeah. <laughs> Wild. Oh, shoot. Ah, it's back over there. We'll go later. I thought of a house down there. We're at 29th and Q. That means we got to go up now. Sorry for the camera confusion here. Just give me a second to get a battery charger going. We've been walking now almost an hour and we have a lot more to go. So we need to get this thing charged. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, charger positioned. Let's get our other glove on. Sorry about that, guys. But we had to get the battery going. Hmm. That's a nice house. I think that's an apartment. No, that's one house. God, that's massive. That is a massive house. I go block too far. I may have gone a block too far. Oh well. It all works out in the end. Well, Georgetown is an old area of D.C., dating back to the times of the settlement of the country, almost. Most of the houses were built in the 1800s, though there are a few that were built earlier than that. So we're coming up to 29th and R. Actually, I thought we were 30th and R, but this will work. There's a couple of famous houses around here. I've shown you a couple of these houses before, but we'll do it this. <laughs> Okay, here we go, 2920 R Street, 2920 R Street, most recently known 
as the home of Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post. It was from these walls that the decisions on the Pentagon Papers and Watergate were made. Catherine Graham entertained many of Washington, D.C.'s social and political elite here at this house. But prior to that, this house was owned by a man known William Donnelly, or to his friends, Wild Bill Donnelly. Wild Bill Donnelly was the founder of the OSS, the precursor to the CIA. He was a legend in the military, Medal of Honor winner. I think he won all four of the meritorious um, service, like the most uh, bravery type awards in the military. And uh, he went on to lead the OSS and the CIA. And this is where Bill Donnelly lived before they sold the property to Catherine Graham. Now let's go down this side street here because also in this neighborhood are two other CIA directors. Who also were both OSS. He is buried at Arlington Cemetery, though I can't get over there right now. He had quite a distinguished career. I know his grandson died in Vietnam, so I don't know if he has any surviving kin. So this is Dent Street, D-E-N-T, the 3000 block of Dent. And we're going to go over there. I haven't done the Appalachian Trail. I just got too much stuff going on. It would be fun to hike it all, though. I hear it's really tough to do the whole thing. Stupid truck. So over here is 3028 Dent Street. 3028 Dent Street was the former home of Bill Colby, who C-O-L-B-Y. Colby was the director of the CIA under uh, Ford and Carter. He was the one who uh, instituted a lot of the reforms of the CIA that were made possible by the Church Commission. And he was replaced as the head of the CIA by George Bush, who became the next director of the CIA. So that's where Bill Colby lived. The other CIA director was Bill Casey. He lived over in Calarama. We'll see his house a bit later. But there's one more CIA director who lived down the street here. So we'll go see his house. And then, how do we know that? This is all public knowledge. All this stuff is uh, public known, publicly known, written about in newspapers, the spy magazines. Not something the Spy Museum has done presentations. There's actually a book called Spy Sites of Washington, D.C. It's a really good book if you're interested. You can find out a lot more about Washington, D.C. spy sites. Maybe I should have a giveaway and give away the book or something. <laughs> the Spy Museum is down by the National Mall. It's actually kind of open. On the weekend, they're kind of open. But during the week, they're closed. They have, like, limited, limited opening hours. Colby's in Arlington Cemetery, too. Okay. And that's where he lived. It was actually rather nondescript, modest house, you know. It wasn't like a grand Georgetown home for entertaining. Hmm. President Biden is flying to Camp David today. I saw there's a helicopter call about 5.30. Weather should be okay. Yesterday I caught his motorcade because I think they opted out of flying on this little trip.
The CIA World Factbook is kind of like an encyclopedia of the world. A lot of good statistics and numbers in there. Okay, let's go down the street a bit. Uh. I wanted to go across the street. But we're going to pause here for a moment. I send a text message to my rather annoying kids. Okay, we got to go down about two blocks. There's so much crap in my pockets. Sorry about the camera, guys. Whew. And we're back. Yeah, there's absolutely no reason to come to DC right now. Everything is closed. It's boring here. <laughs> I would not come to DC right now. Not only that, it's cold. We've got like a couple weeks of like cold weather projected. Okay, 2723 Q Street is our next, next place we're going to visit. And it's just up ahead here. This is 2727. I think we need the next one. There it is. That is 2723 Q Street. And that is the home of Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles was the CIA director back in the time of Kennedy. He was the longest serving CIA director in history. And he lived here. His brother was the Secretary of State, was it? And then also the uh, ambassador over to uh, Vietnam, John Foster Dulles. But Alan lived here. Alan Welsh Dulles. He was in charge of the Bay of Pigs operation, and when that failed rather miserably, he took the rap and he resigned. Okay, where are we got to go now? We got to go down to the right. This camera's really bugging me. Ugh. Sorry, we're taking off the hoodie. Letting ourselves breathe for a second. There we go. Where can you find me when Periscope shuts down? Um, I'll still be on Twitter, Penguin6. I'll be on YouTube, Penguin6. I'll be on HAPS, H-A-P-P-S, HAPS. 
I'll probably be on Twitch as the Penguin Six because I can't get my username on Twitch. But uh, you'll find me. I'll be around. It's also a Facebook, the Penguin Six on Facebook, though I don't really broadcast there. But I usually uh, let people know what I'm up to over there. My goal is to find the perfect streaming solution that'll broadcast to like every platform simultaneously, along with let me saving the video. Yeah, well, I got grandmas, so I have to keep in touch with my grandma. <laughs> the kids have grandma. That's why you use Facebook. Wow. Well, Haps is a beta. It's a beta app, so it's uh, it's still coming around. Yeah, it can be buggy. I tried to go live the other day and I couldn't get live. So we're going to go down here and we're going to find the house of a famous CIA operative or OSS operative who lived down at the end of the street. One that you guys have heard of, but not because of the CIA. We go house hunting? No, they don't put the prices up. What's the fun if they don't have the prices? Too gauche, I guess. loose brick. Ah. We got a lot of snow melt out, a lot of this blue ice melter sand stuff. That guy's just taunting me with the electric bike. That might become an option later. What, snow melt? <laughs> I taught you the new word snow melt. This stuff is like blue goo. Gosh, I don't know. So, where are we at? 27th and Dumbart. And we got to go about two more blocks. This house recently was gutted, so I'm not sure what it even looks like. I mean, I know what it looked like when the OSS operative lived there. But uh, we'll have to see if, because it was like, a, it was probably like, I think it literally was the most run-down house in Georgetown. <laughs> Still sold for a ridiculous amount of money. And they basically tore out everything to rebuild it.
Uh, where are we at now? 27th and N is in Nancy. Hmm. There's a property also ahead at 25th and E I want to show you, but I don't even know how to get there. I was looking at the maps and it looks like it's like blocked off completely. This is just a park. I think it's called Rose Park. We're up above Rock Creek Parkway right now, which you can hear the cars and the traffic down below. But generally the neighborhood people just come out here and play. Ah, it's still pretty much here. It's been renovated, though. Being renovated, I should say. So over there on my right, you guys see that little yellow house. Back in World War II, there was a person who wanted to help out the country. And they applied to be like a work with airplanes and stuff, but they were too tall. They were really a tall person, so they said, we can't get you a job there. They said, but there's this new organization called the OSS, and they could use you. So they went over to the OSS in sort of an administrative role, really just kind of almost like a typist. But they were very well educated, very well spoken, and quickly caught the attention of Bill Donovan, who moved them up the ranks of the OSS. Eventually, they went over to China started working with the organizations over there, Kuming and stuff, China. And while there, this agent was tasked with cooking up a concoction to keep sharks away from underwater mines. Because the, the little explosives they were using over in China, the sharks would come up and detonate them. So they cooked up a little bit of an invention to keep the sharks away, a shark repellent. Now cooking became a big deal for this person when they moved to France. And they decided no longer to be a spy, but to be a chef. Do you guys know who I'm talking about? Julia Child. This was the house of Julia Child, one of the most famous chefs, one of the most famous cooks. Julia Child lived here as a young woman. She eventually married, I guess his name was Peter Child, when she met him in China. And that is Julia Child's house, the spy who liked to cook. <laughs> that is Julia Child's house. Her first house in Washington, D.C. She had a couple others, but that was the first one. No, it's not a museum. It was a rental house. And actually, it was kind of funny. The guy who used to rent it said that he would have roommates who just came to live there because they were such fans of Julia Child, even though the house was beyond decrepit. It was really run down. Somebody just bought it and renovated it, and they're going to live there, I guess. But uh, that's well known as the Julia Child house. Okay, let's cut into downtown D.C. now. Oh, what do we have down here? You know, there's... Ah, uh, it's not worth it. I guess we get, we get cut through this homeless camp. Yeah. There are a lot of homeless camps in D.C. Oh, there's a fence. So I got to go around. So this is the Georgetown District. We are going to go over the bridge, but we're going to cut over the Pennsylvania Avenue Bridge. Ah, oh, shoot. Let's see if we can go over this street. I think we can go down into Rock Creek Park. This is the Four Seasons Hotel. Many foreign dignitaries stay here. It is assumed that some of these rooms are bugged. <laughs> I've seen heads of state come and rent like an entire floor of this building is kind of Frogger-like.
The Pentagon is on the other side. As you're looking at the camera right now, the Pentagon, as the crow flies, is about a mile and a half on the other side of the river. But for me to walk there, it'd be like two miles at least. So we're now down on the Rock Creek Parkway and the bike lanes, down by the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. Chesapeake and Ohio, I always called it Cumberland and Ohio. I always messed that up. Okay, Chesapeake and Ohio. MGM National Harbor is quite far. It's uh, the southern corner of the city, just over the border in the southern corner. So it's like, it's like a 10 minute drive. I mean, it's a 10 minute, 10 miles or something. It's like, oh, 20 or 30 minutes to get across town. I'm in Georgetown. And this is the CNO Canal over there on the right. And then this is Rock Creek here on the left. And we're going to make our way over to the Watergate and then over to the State Department and see what, see what buildings we can find over there. So just for planning purposes, my goal is to take you over to the State Department then down over towards the White House. Then we're gonna cut back up Embassy Row and take in a few more spy stories on Embassy Row. Uh, we're probably halfway done. Probably about an hour more to go, I guess. March 5th, gonna be a little crazy at that time in DC. I'm going to put this up on YouTube, but I'm not entirely sure when, because this is going to be that the raw data files are going to be about 100 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes of 4K data. It's uh, it's not easy to work with that. <laughs> yes, there's a whole bunch of buildings in Virginia that have all sorts of significance in the spying world. I'm not over there, though, so I just sort of kept here in D.C. today. There are some older areas of Virginia too. For example, Old Town Alexandria. Ah. If any of you ever find yourselves missing the smell of a public toilet, just walk through that bridge. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty foul. Hmm. What do we have over here? We have some police activity over here. I don't know if they filmed that. I thought they filmed it in like Texas or something. We have several police cars and an ambulance over by the Watergate at the moment. Not sure what's going on. And the DC police, so probably just a local thing. Yeah, this road goes one way in a couple hours. It switches to an expressway outbound. Lots of cameras up on this pole as per DC. Hmm, I'm trying to think. There's a thing I want to film, yeah? But it's almost inaccessible. by the airport, but there's a park. You mean to park your car or a park to play with by the airport? There is a place at the airport called Gravelly Point at Reagan National Airport. There is a park known as Gravelly Point and it is directly underneath the runway. And the planes come right over your head. It's just north of Reagan National called Gravelly Point and it's very popular with aircraft spotters, kids, 
and old guys who do videos like me. <laughs> okay. I think the police are breaking up the scene now. I'm going to give them some space. Guys complaining got hit or something. This is known as like one of the most expensive gas stations in the city. <laughs> Valero's in Florida? What is it, like a gas station from Latin America or something? I've never heard of Valero. Oh yeah, we're at the Watergate. <laughs> kind of forgot that we got... To... Yeah, it must be a chain, I guess. So up on my right is where the Democratic National Committee headquarters was. And over on my left is the Howard Johnsons, or the former Howard Johnsons. The Watergate burglars had a command center. I think it was room 723 of the Howard Johnsons. And they could see over to this side and see the burglars making their way through the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Uh, there's multiple entrances. The hotel entrance is there. There's a Ferrari there. <laughs> so uh, George Washington University used to own that building and they would allow the top student in political science to live in room 723, the burglar's room. And it had lots of memorabilia about the Watergate break-in. If you watch closely the movie Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump stayed in that Howard Johnson's <laughs> and uh, called in the Watergate burglars to the DC police. It's not a hotel, the Watergate Hotel, I don't even know if it's popular anymore. I've never stayed. The hotel is actually a residence. Can people enter that hotel? Yeah, you can stay there. Um, this is actually mostly condominiums, but they're like 1965 condominiums. So they're not really that big. Uh, Monica Lewinsky lived here. Bob Dole lived here. A lot of other politicians and celebrities lived in the Watergate. Yeah, it's, I mean, you gotta remember, it's almost 50, 60 years old now. They used to have a grocery store here. They used to have a Safeway. But uh, I don't know what happened to it. Went out of business. Okay. That's 25th up there. We're gonna go over 25th and E if we can. Hmm. So that big tall building straight ahead, that's something. I think that's State Department. That's not the main State Department, it's part of the State Department. It's like extra offices. And I've seen it pop up before in people's like spy location lists of DC. They pointed out that building, but they don't say what's in there. So I'm not really sure, but I do know that there's something on the other side of the street from that building. I just don't know how to get to that because the roads are all blocked. This is the Saudi embassy right over here, by the way, the Saudi Arabian embassy. And behind that is the Kennedy Center. Benito Juarez. Hmm. Oh, well, hello. We can see it from here. Very interesting. <laughs> okay, guys, can you see off in the distance a red brick building? with a small little dome on the roof. Oh, that statue is uh, Benito Juarez. That building over there is the original CIA headquarters. That was the OSS slash CIA headquarters in Washington, DC. I believe the address is 2520 E Street. E is in Edward. And I believe it's still operational. I believe there are CIA people working in that building and the building behind it as well. Both of those buildings are still in use by the CIA. Homeless camp. These things are everywhere in DC. So 
So let's go over here, see what we can see. The escalators at Union Station are pretty gross. So I don't know how close I can get. This road kind of dead ends. But that red brick building straight ahead, and there's a sandstone, limestone colored building behind it. Those were the original headquarters of the OSS CIA on the grounds of the U.S. Naval Observatory. The, the observatory has moved. That's the old observatory. Now it's like Naval Medical Command or something like that. Hello, Sweden. So that's the red brick building where the OSS CIA got its start. And I'm told CIA is still there. Union Station is about th three or four miles from here. So let's go, let's go over to the State Department where there was a Russian spy doing some weird stuff a few years back. That was the Naval Observatory, and then they decided to move the Naval Observatory up to where the Vice President currently lives. So the U.S. Naval Observatory is now officially at the, you know, where the Vice President is. This is the old observatory, which I think now is like um, Medical Command or some other Naval Medical thing. It's got a bunch of wild little government office buildings. The vice president's house is under repair. I have seen people actually working out there. No idea when they're going to move in. Al Gore didn't move in for like six months. And I think uh, Cheney, or Qu Cheney was a month, one month delay. So the State Department is down about two blocks on the right. <laughs> Not quite KOA campground. The, uh, the homeless, because of a lot of the fences around the White House and the Capitol, a lot of the homeless have been pushed into other parks. The White House is surrounded by a number of steam grates, uh, steam tunnels that run between different government buildings. and They push out steam, kind of like you see in New York City. And they're very warm. The homeless like to sleep on them. But with everything fenced up and secure, they've kind of been shunted off to the side. There's a rather large homeless camp up ahead on this street. I think if you look at my YouTube videos, I saw President Biden driving past the homeless camp yesterday. Whew. Pakistan. Welcome to Washington, D.C., where we're coming up to 25th and Virginia Avenue, which is uh, just next to, to the State Department. I believe also it's the World Health Organization's Washington, D.C. Atlas.
Okay. Woo. So this is Foggy Bottom, George Washington University. Most of the buildings you're looking at now are part of the George Washington University campus. Down to my right is the Lincoln Memorial, off in the distance, about four or five blocks. Then that entrance over there, on the right, where you see a little minibus coming out, that's the entrance to the CIA's Washington office. That's about as close as I can get. This is the WHO's Washington, D.C. office. And let's go down to this park. I don't know where Mike Pence is right now. That is the Naval Observatory, but that's the old Naval Observatory. That's not the Vice President's Naval Observatory. They only use that one until they left that, I think, in the 1800s, I think, is when they left. Late 1800s. District. Okay, where are we at? Kelly Park. Virginia and 21st. We're almost there. I was down here yesterday filming the President's Motorcade. Okay, so this little park here, I believe it's called Kelly Park. A few years back, there was a Russian diplomat called Stanislav Gusev. And he would park his car over here and go into the park and read the Washington Post upside down. <laughs> Literally, he had the newspaper upside down. He was uh, fiddling with a briefcase and then he would go back and pump some coins into the meter and then come back, read his paper, and fiddle with the briefcase some more. It was later discovered that he was operating a secret microphone that was inside the furniture of the State Department in one of the rooms. They had put a microphone inside, like, the table. And this Russian diplomat would sit out here with his little backpack and tune in to the conversations going on inside the State Department. He was, of course, expelled for doing stuff not part of the diplomatic mission, but the question of who put the microphone in the State Department was never publicly revealed. One of those big mysteries. <laughs> and that took place right here at 21st and Virginia Avenue. Yes, very creative. Now, yesterday you saw me film the vice president or the president's uh, motorcade making its way to the NIH to see Dr. Fauci, and the president's motorcade went right down this street, past this one of the largest homeless camps near the White House.
government puts out toilets, hand wash stations. But there are many, many people living in these tents. Yeah, some of them are just filled with trash. The White House is, uh, what is this, 20th Street? So the White House is three, four blocks up the street. I was actually standing right over there in that park when I filmed the motorcade go by into this uh, road. Hmm, this would have been a better place to stand. I just didn't have enough time to get positioned. It was pure luck that I ended up being here. Okay, so we're gonna make our way down over towards the White House, where there was a rather crazy spy ring running in the 1970s and 80s at a little bar nearby. Donuts. Yeah, they like to do that. Especially when you pull out a camera. The thing you don't understand is about when there's a presidential motorcade, there is a police car at every single intersection between the White House and the final destination. So they drove out to Bethesda yesterday, which is like 15 miles. And they had police cars at every on-ramp, every off-ramp, every intersection from here to there. We're talking hundreds of police officers involved in that motorcade yesterday. Which is why they prefer to fly sometimes. <laughs> it's far less disruptive, far less costly. But uh, yesterday we had kind of sleety, icy snow. Not really good flying conditions for a helicopter. I mean, it can be done, but why risk it? <sighs> Nineteenth and E. Let's cut up here. Just to be different. So we're back into the foggy bottom area of George Washington University. Some of these buildings are rolled back. This building on my right is the General Services Administration. These are the, these are the people that handle like all the office leases for the government nationwide. They handle buying like 10 million mops or 6,000 post-it notes or whatever else is needed for government services, the GSA. The bummer thing about this hike is that the last bit of this hike is all uphill. <laughs> it's like punishment. So from here back to my house is about three miles. The Organization of American States, they have a very historic building down on the National Mall by the White House, but I guess this is a, their office building. That's kind of like the Latin American UN.
<laughs> Look at this building. It's got like four cameras around the corner. This building is ringed with cameras. Yeah. Two cameras on the driveway, three cameras on this corner. That's a bit mental. <sighs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I, my face has been scanned by so many of these cameras that they should probably know everything about me. If they don't, they're not doing their job. I mean, I'm here nearly every day. Okay, let's go over this way. Find the World Bank. This is the World Bank's main building right over here on the left. And that's actually got one of the best cafeterias in town. Here are those moving bus ads. And they've been displaying FBI wanted posters for the last couple of weeks. This is the pipe bomber. Uh, wrap, the video's a little fuzzy. Uh, it'll come back and forth depending on the bandwidth. Go down over here. You know, I'm not even sure if this place is still here. Uh, it should be. This place was like an institution, but it might have died because of uh, because of all the COVID shutdowns. the next block. They used to have an office over here. Many, many years ago. Hmm. It looks open. So guys, this little place on my left with the uh, dining domes is a bar known as The Exchange. Now, The Exchange has been here for Oh God, I don't know, 40 or 50 years? Yeah, DC's oldest sports saloon. However, <laughs> this was opened by two Czechoslovakian uh, spies, basically. They were illegal spies. They weren't part, of, they were like, they would, they, were, they would be disacknowledged or whatever if they got arrested. They wouldn't be covered by whatever rules existed. And they ran the exchange. And one of their big clients at the exchange was an organization called Capital Couples. All right? Capital Couples at a place called The Exchange. Are you guys kind of getting the idea of what went on here? You should. Okay. So they ran a little intelligence gathering operation based on their, uh, their desires. <laughs> And we're able to ensnare a few people with uh, behavior that probably wouldn't be approved on most of the uh, top secret security clearances. So that place has a little bit of a strange history. <laughs> Across the street is the entrance to the White House. Over there is also Blair House, where the vice president is currently staying. And we are actually not even going to go to the White House today. Well, it looks like they've taken down... No, they're still working on the construction. We're going to bypass the White House today and make our way up the street. This building, by the way, is the new, the new executive office building. This is the old executive office building, which is also known as the wedding cake building because it looks like a wedding cake. But that's where all the president's staff uh, work and have their offices. The new executive office building is where the Secret Service are based and the National Security Council. Yeah. There we go. Also on the roof, I think I've mentioned this before, on the roof of that building is a missile battery. Some close in air defense of the city. And this guy up here is selling Trump and Biden sweatshirts. All sorts of tourist stuff. The 
some Trump stuff is falling by the wayside. He doesn't have it out right now. He's got some Kamala Harris stuff. So we're going to go down here and see what we can see. Might get a scooter later. Mm -hmm. What are we H? We need to go to I. We need to go to 18th and I. Oh, they're finally taking the plywood down from this building. So we were here last week and uh, this building was covered in plywood because of potential riots and they finally have taken it all down as well as the one on the other side of the street too. They've taken the plywood down from that side. So getting back a little to normal. I wonder if they keep all this stuff in a warehouse for the next riot. The plywood went up for the George Floyd protest, then it came down, then it went up for the election, then it came down, and then it went up for the inauguration. It was just kind of crazy. I think how many trees were killed. Then the mayor got mad. The mayor's like, stop making the city look like it's a hurricane victim, you know? And she told everybody to take the plywood down. It's cold again. So, let's spin over here. There's a quiet little place over here, I know. Yes, it is very dead. We're coming up to 18th and I. It's actually a subway station called Farragut West. Remember? Farragut, I don't remember. No, that's not that. And there's another place down here that has a little bit of a espionage background. I should get a sandwich. I'm actually kind of hungry. There's not really any good pit beef places in DC. They're all kind of a Maryland thing. So if I want a pit beef, there's one place, but to get to it, I gotta drive across the city and not like conveniently across the city, but like stoplight to stoplight across the city. It's kind of annoying. <sighs> now this next little place, most people don't know about this place. <laughs> But this red brick building is, or was, the headquarters of the Alibi Club. The Alibi Club, and they still have the sign on the door, Alibi Club. The Alibi Club is limited to 50 members. All members must be unanimously voted in 
by all other members, and it is a who's who of the national intelligence and defense and political authority of the United States. The Secretary of Defense, the CIA director, the chief of staff, they all have membership in this super exclusive alibi club where they can meet up and discuss things in private outside of prying eyes. This is right across from Farragut West. So let's start heading up this way. What time is it? Check the watch. Ooh, we've been out this couple hours. Uh, oh, my phone's going. So guys, I tell you what, I am going to stop the Periscope, but I'm going to keep the YouTube going. So if you guys want to watch on YouTube, it'll be up a little bit later. I need to save the battery on my phone. Now for the YouTubers, I think you see what I see. I think you know what I'm thinking too. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like walking. Kids need to get something to eat. So let's see if we can get one of these. Uh, yep. We are renting a scooter. This is going to take us back up. Da -da -da -da. Oh, it's got a weak battery, though. Should have got a better one. 39%. That should get us where we need to go, though. Yeah, baby. Woohoo! Now we're not allowed to ride on the sidewalks downtown, so we gotta find a bike lane. So we're gonna go back up um, Massachusetts Avenue, Embassy Row, and we'll take you past a couple embassies, a few other spy stories. And then we'll make our way back to home. I gotta buy the kids lunch. I haven't figured out what I'm gonna feed them today. Kids have the day off today. It's a school holiday. There's a Shake Shack up here. Maybe we'll get a burger. The brakes on this thing are pretty rough. Crazy woman to my left. Whee. That was like, poor woman's got some demons going. It's kind of like a zombie movie, moving closer towards me, screaming. Okay, let's get out of the downtown area, make our way up to DuPont Circle, and then on up to the embassies. These things only go about 10 miles an hour, and to be honest, this one's a little bit slow.
you know, this bike length. There's always some guy parking in the bike lane. Oh, we'll have to edit that out. <laughs> So now we're in the uh, west end of D.C., mostly office buildings, a few restaurants. CBS News, their headquarters is down here. So whenever you see like a CBS reporter saying, reporting live from Washington, they're usually just standing right here on M Street. It's not like they're, uh, they're going out on assignment. They just like walk out the front door. <laughs> Ugh, the bike lane is not a parking lane. You just hit them. All right, where are we at? 20th Street. This will take us up to Massachusetts and then on up the hill. Oh. Oh, I might have to put my hood back up again. It's getting cold. Yeah, we made it. Now these buses are actually free, these circulator buses. You can ride those for free, you don't have to like pay a fare. Which is kind of neat, except they don't go exactly where I want to go. Now once we get out of the downtown sector, I can go up on the sidewalk, legally, so. Mmm, donuts. There's a Krispy Kreme right around the corner. Tempting, tempting. This is a great used bookstore. This is called Second Story Books. This is a used bookstore. It's been around for like 50 years. And uh, they actually have a really good collection because people in DC, DC has a lot of like book collectors or just sort of like hoarders. I don't know what you want to call them. So you can usually find a lot of good recent titles there. Okay, we're going to go up the Embassy Row now. So basically, almost everything you're going to see for the next 10-15 oh, minutes are going to be embassies. Or related to embassies. For example, up here on the left is the Embassy of Portugal. And the Embassy of Portugal is next to the Embassy of Indonesia, which is a beautiful old building. This is all Indonesia. And over on the right-hand side is the Embassy of India. They've had a lot of protests lately. You know, there's a lot of farmers having protests in India. And a lot of those supporters have actually come to the embassy to protest as well. You also see uh, Gandhi walking there on the statue. This is the, so the Society of Cincinnati, which is descendant of colonial military officers, kind of like a Daughters of the American Revolution. They have a really cool museum, though, in the basement on the history of the Revolutionary War. 
This is a Czech statesman from President of Czechoslovakia, 1918-1935. See, we do stop for red lights occasionally. That's the old Estonian embassy over there. I think it's being renovated right now. I think this is Luxembourg on the left, and the De Turkish Defense Attaché's office is left. And we'll see what else we can find. Here we go. There's another uh, spy kind of story up here I'll tell you in a minute. We go past these embassies. Was that Togo? Uh, Benin or something? I can't remember. I couldn't see the sign. The Greek embassy is over on my right. And we just passed Bahamas. And here on my left is the Irish embassy. And it's right over here by the Irish embassy. Let's see if we. Here's the plaque. This plaque. This plaque is dedicated to Orlando Letlier and who's the other woman? Ronnie Moffat. They were working for the Chilean, and it was the Chilean ambassador and one of the aides for President Allende, who was overthrown by the Pinochet government one day and his car exploded right there where you saw that plaque between the Irish and Romanian embassies. So a car bomb killed the former Chilean ambassador and it was pretty much laid to pretty much thought to be the Pinochet's men who had done it though I don't think it was ever formally prosecuted in the US because uh, relations were sensitive at the time. Now there's a house up here hang on a second Oh, what do we have over there? We have uh, Philippines and Vietnam. I think that's Egypt. I've got to grab something out of my pocket. I need another glove. It's so cold. Okay. Oh, let's see if we can find this house. 2501. So I'm on that side of the street. Okay, just getting our gloves set. Oh, Kenya, Vietnam, Philippines. I thought this was Egypt. I'm not entirely sure because I think Egypt moved. It might be the old one. This is uh, Chile right there, then Haiti, and then the former Pakistani embassy, which is being used for something else right now. I think it's on the market. Over here is Burkina Faso. And up here is the Kyrgyz Republic, which I think we used to call Kyrgyzstan. Now it's the Kyrgyz Republic. That's that red flag. Over on the right is Croatia. And then this is the Korean, Korean Cultural Affairs uh, section of their embassy. And over there <laughs> is a fun little story. Right now, what you see is Cameron, Cameroon's embassy, the embassy of Cameroon. That used to be Czechoslovakia's embassy. One day, a Czechoslovakian spy was working with the FBI. The FBI borrowed a garbage truck. Yeah, borrowed a garbage truck, drove onto the grounds, and the Czechoslovakian spy threw a cipher machine and a whole reef of documents into the trash truck. The trash truck then left without ever picking up the trash, and the FBI got a hold of a secret code from the Czech Republic. It was said that the Czech security guy then had to go to the Russian embassy later that day and borrow their cipher to file a report that his had been stolen. <laughs> That's the embassy of Chad. That's the Dutch ambassador's house. Jeff Bezos lives back there too. Ivory Coast and let's keep making our way up this hill
This is the Mexican mission to the Organization of the American States. So that's sort of like, not an embassy, but it's like a diplomatic post. And that's the uh, Venezuelan ambassador's house. I'm not sure who lives there because we don't really like the current government of Venezuela. This is the South Korean embassy. There was a Korean uh, spy once who was uh, caught red-handed there catching some secrets from an American spy. And up here is the Japanese embassy, the old Japanese embassy, where it is said on December 7th, 1941, the American security services noticed people burning documents and machines here at the Japanese embassy. This is also, I think, was the Japanese ambassador's residence, but he's now moved. Whoa, it's a little cold. Over on your right, you see the Turkish ambassador, or the Turkish embassy. The Turkish ambassador was back by where the Chilean guy got blown up. And let's go back behind the mosque here. The Islamic Center of Washington, D.C. is over here. Because behind it is something cool that I've shown you many times. Here we go. This red brick building here on the right is the Russian Defense Attaché's house. The Russian Defense Attaché is where they do all their spying. Americans who are wanting to like work with the Russians have actually been filmed going up into this building by FBI watchers who are in the area. But this is where the Russians do all their spying. Now behind this house is where Ivanka Trump lived, and just down this street behind that Secret Service car is where Barack Obama has his house. I don't go down there because, well, they don't take too kindly to tourists. Ooh, up we go. Now the big uphill part. Thankfully, I'm on this scooter. <laughs> so now we're going over Rock Creek Parkway again. This is a beautiful park. It's run by the National Park Service. It's like 1,700 acres. There are deer and coyote in this park. It connects, it's sort of also can bring animals down into the heart of the city. There's been deer at the White House actually that have came down through Rock Creek Park. So over on our left, what do we got? We got the Italian Embassy on our immediate left. Hillary Clinton lives at the end of that street. Then we have the Brazilian ambassador's house. It's a pretty nice looking place. Next to the Brazilian ambassador is the Brazil embassy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I always call that Brazil, yeah, because it looks so modern compared to the old ambassador's place. This place on the right, is the former Iranian ambassador's house. And this building is the former Iranian embassy. Now, these buildings are maintained by the US State Department as we don't have diplomatic relations with Iran. And as such, it's not technically an embassy. That's the Bolivian embassy. Over here is the South African embassy. And we talked about that South African spy earlier in the show. Here's the Mandela sculpture. Sculpture. Now over there is the British ambassador's residence. At one time, most of the Cambridge spy, spy crew served in the Washington embassy. And uh, their shenanigans over here were well known. Oof. Let's make our way up this hill. 
it's getting colder and colder. This is the British Embassy under massive renovation right now. I think it's pretty much empty. With everybody work from home, it's pretty much the perfect time to renovate. A lot of the embassies are under renovation right now. Straight ahead is the U.S. Naval Observatory. This is the south entrance. Uh, this is the entrance closest to the White House. The helicopter landing pad is just up over that ridge. Just last week, they finally removed the uh, chain link fence, riot fence that was around here. You saw that in my videos the other day. Uh. So you're on Massachusetts Avenue right now, coming up to 34th Street. For those of you who've been following on a map, there's the Vice President's house, just up on that ridge. I don't see anyone working on the chimney right now. Not sure when she'll move in. As I mentioned, uh, Dick Cheney took one month to move into the Vice President's house. Al Gore actually waited six months while they were renovating the pipes and the water plumbing. That house is really quite old. There's a very exclusive neighborhood over there on the other side of those trees. Those are multi, multi-million dollar homes. I think we looked at one that was like 15 million over there. There's a vacant lot over there that's currently on the market for $4 million. Just a, a scrub of land. So here we are at the Finland Embassy. This is the happiest nation on earth, so they like to proclaim that the Finland guy is going to hit. And they have a little library where I often come to get books. This is the Vatican's Embassy, for lack of a better word. I think it has a different title than Embassy, but it's basically their embassy. And up here is Norway the Norwegian embassy under major renovations right now. I think the Norwegian ambassador and the embassy are all kind of located in the same place. Uh, over there is the U.S. Naval Observatory main entrance. That's where the vice president will be going in and out to uh, go to work. It's cold. Shoot. And I miss Bill Casey's house. Well, I got so excited telling you the story of the Cameroon Embassy of the Czech Republic. Gone too far. Too far. <laughs> okay, guess what? This stupid thing just geofenced me. <laughs> well, you know what? Screw you. Uh. Well, I got geofenced, which means I can't go any farther. Battery is too low. Okay. So, I didn't get geofenced. The uh, scooter ran out of battery. So now a signal has been sent to Scooter Command, I guess. <laughs> and they'll come retrieve it. And I have to walk the rest of the way home. <laughs> oh well, it was fun while it lasted. My legs feel like light after riding on that thing. Whew. Oh, there's some other scooters. I could just grab one of those. I guess in a hurry. Ah. 
that guy is doing like 60 miles an hour on a little side street. <laughs> and then he just flew over a speed bump. <laughs> kind of random. embassy on our right. I think there's actually two embassies in here. I think like East Timor and Cape Verde share this embassy. Not entirely sure. This is a Buddhist center. I don't really know who runs this one. If it's connected with any of the foreign missions or not. This is the Iraqi ambassador slash embassy. I think this is now the official embassy. And I think the one downtown is like the consulate or something. But it doesn't really look like a very big place. Oop. Police car is coming. Coming the wrong way. This is really random. Truancy and curfew enforcement. <laughs> How can you have a truancy officer if all the kids are at school at home? That's kind of weird. I think I read in some of the public schools like 15 to 20 percent of the kids have basically never, ever checked in for online school at all. And on a daily basis, a large proportion just aren't even watching in some of the more harder hit areas. Some areas have got a very good attendance rate, but in some areas, these kids are missing out. In fact, I think Virginia is seriously considering summer school for all kids this summer to try to catch up, which I don't know. Parents have been complaining they're not in school, and then they're going to complain they have to go to summer school. And it's a bit crazy. My kids are in school one week, and then the next week they're at home. Every two weeks they have to get tested for COVID. In fact, this weekend is their COVID test date. So I'm going to drag them over to school. They're getting pretty used to it. Guess what? We're back on the grounds of the National Cathedral where this big hike started. We'll walk up this hill a bit, sign off, and go update this video. Now, if you're interested in more about spies in Washington, D.C., there's a book, I believe, called Spy vs. Spy by a guy named like Kessler, who is a national security reporter for the Washington Post or other magazines. There is a book called Spy Sites of Washington, D.C., which is basically a tour guide to spy locations in Washington, D.C. And there's a lot of other books that have been written about the espionage community, the intelligence community in Washington, D.C., uh, that I'll try to put in the description below. I should add, none of the things that I showed you are classified. Most of them, of course, were historic. Most of the modern things that I've shown are not classified. They're all open. It's all visible. You can Google everything. It's all out there. <laughs> I 
a lot of the other things I can't show you, well, I can't show you, I could, but they're far away. For example, the National Security Agency is up in Baltimore area. It's about a 30 to 40 mile drive. The NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, is out in Dulles. Again, another half hour, 40 mile drive. And the Defense Intelligence Agency is down in Anacostia, which is part of DC, but it's pretty hard to get to. It's on a military base. It's one of the largest uh, buildings down there on that base. Let's walk up here. It is chilly. Uh, so, let's see, we're going to walk up here, sign off, go edit these videos. If there's other stuff you'd like to see, or if you have questions about any of the things you've seen, just feel free to comment. I can't read all the comments, but I really do try to catch most of your comments. You can also reach out to me in other ways. Penguin6 on Twitter or Instagram, Facebook Penguin6. Oh, that's pretty. Still can't figure out this camera. Well, guys, I'm thinking I'm going to sign off, go get some lunch, and start working on this video. Thanks a lot for joining me on this hike today. We do these a lot. We'll do some more next week. Thanks again. See you soon.